So again, um, I'm Ken Rosenfield, and I'm from Mass General Hospital, and I'm um, going to present about the best CLI trial after my disclosures. So I have the privilege of uh, sitting on the podium with my uh, co-PI of the best CLI trial. I think we've never sat in the same podium and spoken together. And by the way, Christian, in, in terms of the audience, it, it's only it's the most important people that are here, and that's all we care about. So as long as we reach them, because they're the most important people in the whole conference, so I'm, I'm not worried about it. Um, so the question is, why best? Um, the title of my talk was uh, The Purpose and Perspective about Best CLI. Um, why best CLI? Well, obviously there are different revascularization options, options in CLI, and they are between bypass surgery and, and endovascular therapy. Which is the best strategy for the initial treatment of these patients? We still don't know the answer, and I, I would say that I could probably end the talk right there because that is the purpose of best, is to try to help define what is the best strategy. There is a huge amount of variability around this country and around the, the, uh, the world, in fact, about um, how to revascularize. And you can see here, there's, not only are there variations in revascularization uh, that are, are tremendously um, uh, different depending upon where, which region you're in and which city you're in and which hospital you're in, but there's also huge variations in amputation rates. And that shouldn't be the case. There shouldn't be so much variability um, uh, and, and in fact, this is one of my favorite slides. This is from the VQI, which demonstrates that if you come into a hospital, um, certain hospitals in this country uh, with CLI, you will get bypassed 100% of the time. And there are other hospitals at the far left there, if you come in with CLI, you will get an enter endovascular intervention as your first strategy 100% of the time or nearly and everything in between. And again, there should not be this degree of variability or variation in management of this condition across the country. There should be some variation, but in the cardiology world, if you come in with a STEMI, you know, there's variations in treatment, but it's not this wide. Um, and of course, there's a lot of arguments about, you know, in various institutions about whether we should do endo first or, or, um, or surgery first. And that is really the reason for the, the best CLI trial. The, the current data that are out there are very limited. They're retrospective, poorly controlled. The endpoints are suboptimal. There's a lot of bias, and uh, the, the, the follow-up is somewhat less than complete. I mean, this summarizes the, the trials of comparative effectiveness for vascular disease, and you can see that while there have been many trials, large randomized trials um, for carotid disease and AAA, um, there have been very few, in fact, only one that uh, Christian described earlier on, the, on the, the use of endovascular versus bypass surgery in, um, in CLI, and that's the basal trial. And the basal trial was really quite limited. Um, it used balloon angioplasty alone as opposed to surgery, uh, in comparison to surgery. There were no stents, no atherectomy, no any, any of the current devices that were using no drug-coated balloons. Um, and it was an underpowered trial, um, although it did show that there was a, a trend towards benefit for surgery after two years, but, uh, but no difference up to two years. Well, what about just trying endovascular therapy first on every patient with CLI, since best CLI showed that they're, I mean, since uh, basal showed that they're pretty close to each other. Um, and there have been a number of, of studies that have shown that they think that the first strategy should be endovascular therapy, but I would point to basal and say that the patients who had an, a, an attempt at endovascular disease uh, management, endovascular approach first, um, actually did poor, more poorly if they ended up having to go back to surgery because of a failed endovascular approach. So endovascular is not necessarily a free shot. Um, you can actually cause, you can, you can make the, the subsequent surgical procedure more difficult, although this, these data are kind of conflicted because it could be the more difficult patients that ended up coming back with restenosis and so on. But um, the bottom line is that I do think that endovascular is not necessarily a free shot. There are some um, downsides to that as well. So clearly we need more level one evidence, and this is from uh, Skyla Jones um, uh, and Manish Patel, 
who did a, a um, comparative effectiveness, a review of all the literature out there uh, in comparing these different strategies, endo versus open, and their conclusion is that there is a paucity of high-quality data available to guide clinical decision-making, and I think we all know this. Um, so in that setting, we, uh, we come with best CLI, and I give credit to Alec Farber and uh, Matt Menard, who are my co-PIs, for coming up with this idea. I was brought into the trial uh, late, um, uh, prior to the last submission to NIH, which got it approved. Um, and I think it was a brilliant trial. We do need to compare the treatment efficacy, functional outcomes, and cost in patients with CLI undergoing best open surgical or endovascular re revascularization, which is the objective of the trial. It is a prospective, randomized, pragmatic, multicenter, multi-specialty, open-label superiority trial. Say that in one word, in one sentence with one breath, 2,100 patients at 160 clinical sites in North America and two-year follow-up at minimum. And it's a very pragmatic trial, which is to say that the definition of the best treatment is left up to the investigator and you can use any commercially available endovascular device that's out there, even if it's not on label for the, the vessel that you're going to treat with it. Um, and the same thing with bypass surgical techniques. Any conduit is large, allowed. There are two cohorts in the trial, those with uh, patients that, are, that have a good uh, or adequate single segment great saphenous vein for bypass available, and that's three quarters of the patients in the trial, and then one quarter of the patients will have what we call suboptimal conduits, um, and, uh, and those patients will also be randomized between endo and open first. Um, we're also stratifying these patients at the time of randomization because we felt that there were, might be differences in the outcomes uh, based on whether the patient has ischemic breast pain versus tissue loss and whether they have tibial disease or not. So we stratify up front. Uh, the, the end point is a novel one. It's major adverse limb event free survival or male free survival, which, uh, and male is defined as above ankle amputation or a major intervention such as a new bypass graft or a jump or interposition bypass graft or the need for thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Um, and we are also are measuring key secondary endpoints, uh, which is re-intervention and amputation free survival, uh, which is a combination of male, which I described earlier, plus minor intervention like a small patch angioplasty on a, on a restenotic site in a graft or a distal anastomotic site or balloon angioplasty or repeat um, balloon angioplasty, for example, in an endo procedure. Now, we're also looking at hemodynamic outcomes, clinical outcomes, and the Wi-Fi classification that Christian described earlier. So we're also looking, importantly, uh, at the cost of care, uh, both in hospital and out hospital, and functional status of the patient and quality of life. All of these things are obviously incredibly important for the patient with critical limb ischemia. This is an infrainguinal trial. We're not looking at inflow disease, so you have to have adequate inflow in order to be enrolled in the trial, and you have to obviously have CLI, and you have to be a candidate for both open and endo as judged by the treating investigators or the team that's at the site um, so if you may not think the patient is a good endo candidate, somebody in your institution is on your team may actually think they are a good candidate or a reasonable candidate, and the same thing with bypass. So we're encouraging a team-based approach, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> these are our sites uh, around the country, uh, and this is our uh, latest enrollment. Um, I don't know if we've hit uh, the halfway mark. We're four patients away as of uh, uh, as of a couple of days ago from hitting the halfway mark of the 2,100 patients. Um, and uh, the enrollment requirements are fairly steep by NIH. They're trying to get us to enroll as fast as we can. So um, what will best CLI add? Uh, it will answer the questions about whether, you know, what the role is for open versus endo in these subsets of patients that I described. But basically it will define an evidence-based standard of care that we don't have right now. Um, and as Mike Jaff says, it's the most important, impactful, patient-centered clinical trial of our professional lifetime, certainly for CLI. And as Sean Lydon says, the best CLI will define practice for the next 25 years for CLI patients. I'm not sure if it will be 25 years, but it will certainly be for the foreseeable future because it's not going to be a trial that's going to be easy to repeat. I can tell you that. There are lots of obstacles to enrollment. And Christian mentioned this, the bias that people carry uh, when, they, when they see a patient with CLI. They either think that endo is best or surgery is best, and 
Um, they think they know the best way to go. But the, I would just remind everybody that the evidence base is not there to support one way or the other in most of these patients. There are lots of other enrollment obstacles. I won't go through them, but I can tell you this trial has been a struggle, uh, as are all large randomized controlled trials, which um, offer their, uh, two different therapies, one less invasive, one more invasive. Um, but we're, we're getting our targets, and we're, getting, we're accruing patients. And as I would say, we have a, over 1,000 over patients enrolled. There's a secondary goal that has become much more evident to us, and I want to spend a minute on this, and then I'll finish up. But this secondary goal is actually maybe even more compelling than the primary goal, which is to uh, increase the, the uh, interdisciplinary collaboration that happens so that uh, both uh, uh, people who are experienced at endo and those who are experienced at surgery can share ideas, and people that are in different specialties can share ideas and uh, collaborate and share their skill sets. And this raises the bar for everybody uh, treating CLI, and it's really good for patients. Um, in our trial, we have a uh, preponderance of vascular surgeons, but we have lots of interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists and vascular medicine docs. And 81% of our sites are multidisciplinary. And what we found is that the sites where people have been able to work together and develop a team-based approach um, it's actually completely changed the attitude of the, of the uh, investigators at that site. Um, some hospitals are still like this. This is Alex's slide. Um, still fighting the, the battles. But um, I would say that our trial leadership is balanced to, to try to demonstrate the importance of this balanced uh, team-based approach. And uh, we recognize that the, the, the uh, team-based approach may present a challenge because of the stakeholders and the silos that exist but we're trying to encourage that multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, and uh, if our trial is going to define practice, it has to involve everybody. And what we've, what we've created this concept of the CLI team, which is all the specialists who are involved in CLI care at that institution. Um, I would say that uh, the, the, the mission is to maximize interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, not just to ensure successful conduct of the trial, but better care for our CLI patients. The requirements for this, though, are mutual respect and collegiality, a commitment to the concept and the processes that are needed to implement this, um, a willingness to sacrifice and compromise, uh, a willingness uh, to admit that you may not be all-knowing and that, that we can learn from our colleagues, and, and most importantly, the, the focus on the patient first and the, the recognition that, that the team approach benefits a patient much like it does in the cardiology world where we're using heart team approach for our, for example, complex PCI patients. Um, so we need CLI champions and we need CLI team players. I hope you're all uh, that. We have a high mountain to climb to conquer the critical limb ischemia scourge that uh, exists in this country. And, but if we all stick together and link together, then we will get there. Um, so in, in summary, BESS is a landmark trial. It's the largest randomized trial of CLI patients. We'll pr produce the, the highest level of evidence and we'll define care for years to come. We'll answer some important questions, but not all. And it will inform the next set of trials that we're going to run. It's already redefining practice at many sites, including the, the CLI team approach, which we think offers many benefits to patients and physicians alike and will be driven uh, to that, all of us will be driven to that by value-based care. Thank you very much.